B'Shem Hashem Na'asem and Asliyah, welcome to our weekly Zera Shimshon Shi'ur. This week we will be covering Be'ezrat Hashem Itbarach, Parashat Vayishlah from Ot Yud Aleph, Ot 11 from the Zera Shimshon. May the Zechut of the Zera Shimshon be a Melitz Yosher for all of Am Yisrael and send us Yeshuot Benachamot, especially those that need to get married. The Zechut of the Zera Shimshon should find their Zivugim Bizmano Bekarov Be'ezrat Hashem Amen. And those that need a refuah shalama, Hashem should give them a refuah nefesh or refuah haguf. Tonight is also the yard site um, of the Bat Ain. So this shiur is dedicated to Leinu Nishmat the Bat Ain as well. And Leinu Nishmat all kol shochene afar. So in this week's parasha, we learn many um, trials that Yaakov Avinu goes through when it comes to meeting his brother again. Yaakov Avinu is on his way back from Lavan's house. And on his way back, he sends messengers to Esav, his twin brother, whom he knows is coming at him with all he's got. I mean, this was uh, basically preparations for war. And you got to take it into consideration what this means. This was the war between Edom and Israel. The way it has been for thousands of years, this was the core, this was the root of that war. I mean, Greeks, the Romans, all the things that we've had in, in, in thousands of years of Jewish history, it all started with Esav and Yaakov Avinu. Esav was Edom, who became later on the Western world from the Greeks and the Romans and and, and Germany, all of which is diluted, so to speak, into that uh, factor of Esav being their forefather. Yaakov Avinu was all of Judaism. This is the first confrontation between the two, right? And there is a lot that we could learn from Yaakov Avinu as to how to handle certain situations, and how, how Yaakov Avinu handled this situation. This was literally going to war. And we see that Yaakov Avinu prepared in many ways. He prepared through tefillah, prayer, he prepared through strategy, and he prepared through politics. Right? Politics was, he started sending gifts to Esau. Strategy was that he divided his camp into two. He stayed into the, in the front line and sent all the children and the women to another camp so that if he actually goes to war, they will be safe in another camp. And if Yaakov Avinu Chas Shalom loses, they'll have enough time to run away. At least they'll stall. That was strategy. And war. He prepared for war. Yaakov Avinu did prepare for all-out war. And just to let you know, Yaakov Avinu was no... Simple Jew to mess with. Yaakov Avinu was very, very well capable of handling his own, and the people that were with him were very well capable of handling their own. Yaakov Avinu just single-handedly, when he went to, to Lavan's home, we have the story that he single-handedly picked up a stone that needed 10 people to come to pick it up. He single-handedly just threw the stone off of the well just to feed the sheep of Rachel Imenu, of Lavan. So Yaakov Avinu was physically very capable of handling war. Some of, those are just the, some of the things that we learn from the story of Yaakov and Esav. In the meantime, as Yaakov Avinu is preparing for these things, we have the famous night time for Yaakov Avinu. Another night time. Yaakov Avinu goes back to pick up some things that he left over. He left behind. He goes back. There's a lot of Kabbalistic meaning into what, why this is even mentioned in the Torah. You know, it says Yaakov Avinu realized that he left some um, utensils behind across the river. So he told his camp, you guys go further. I'm going to cross over alone to bring these utensils. What these utensils were, why they, were they so important? Some even say that, that one of the utensils, what he went back for is actually the the vessel that the anointing oil for Moshiach is kept in, right? It was the vessel that Yaakov Avinu 
felt was important enough and to go get it, and yeah, it was important enough. There's a lot of commentary that goes on about why Yaakov Avinu crossed over. But he did cross over. And over there it says, Vayvater Yaakov Levado, Yaakov Avinu was left alone, Vayaaver Ish Imo, and a man, Ish, came and quarreled with him, fought with him physically, Ad Alot HaShahar, until dawn, until morning time. This is, by the way, for those of you who don't know, it's a very nice song by Mordechai Ben David, I should tell you, it's a, one of my favorite songs. You, you don't know the song? Please tell me. I was just wondering why it was even made into a song. Why it was made into a song? Okay, I'll tell you right now. But the song goes like this, you know? Hey, he goes to Shazami. Okay, so why it's why it is um, actually significant? Very good question. I always thought the same question. Why is this? Why is this line that Yaakov Avinu was left alone and and somebody came and fought with him? Why is it significant to become a song? Right, because the word alone, levado, as far as if I remember correctly. In the Torah, or I think in Tanakh, is used twice, if I'm not mistaken. One time the word levado alone is used for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and the other time it is used for Yaakov Avinu. When you have a terminology used only twice between two people, that terminology becomes a connecting factor. Meaning, just like God is one of a kind, so are you one of a kind. Right? So these two are compared together. Yaakov Avinu, in a sense, being the father of the Jewish nation, was the only Yaakov Avinu. Hence the connection between HaKadosh Baruch Hu and Yaakov Avinu. That's why it became into a song. Right? It's an important pasuk. Then after that, it says, Vayavo Yaakov, so he, he fights with this. Man, which was the angel of Esav. We know that it was the angel of Esav that he fought with all night long. Then it says, Vayavo Yaakov Shalem Iru Shechem. Yaakov came complete, whole, to the city of Shechem. Asher Be'eretz Kenan, that was in the, in the, in the land of Kenan. Beba'omi Padan Aram, when he came from Padan Aram. Vayichan et Penei Ha'ir. Right? And he encamped before the city. What do these two have, in, have to do with each other? So the Midrash says, very interesting Midrash. Midrash Rabbah says like this, Midrash Rabbah Yud Aleph. It says, Avraham she'en katuv bo shemirat Shabbat. Avraham Avinu, which we don't have a place where it says anything about Avraham Avinu keeping Shabbat. There's no instance in the Torah where we see that Yaakov Avinu kept, uh, Avraham Avinu kept Shabbat. And because it, there's nothing that says Abraham Avinu ever kept Shabbat, it says, Yarash et ha'olam b'mida. He inherited the world by measure. Hold on to that thought. Avraham Avinu, who there is no mention of him keeping Shabbat, inherited the world for his children by measure. Shene'emar, as it says, Kum hitalech ba'aretz le'orkah ul'rochbah. The pasuk says about Abraham Avinu, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, Get up and go on the land le'orkah ul'rochbah. To its width and its length. Meaning, go, go along this land to its width to its, and, and to its length. That already gives a measurement of how far you can go. Right? You only have this land, Eretz Israel. In its length and its width. This is your Yerusha. This is your inheritance. That's what we have about Abraham Avinu. Meaning, Abraham Avinu got gifted by God. A gift from Hashem. Four generations for his children. But limited. It was measured. You have this land. It's width and its length. But it says, Aval Yaakov, Shekatuv Bo, Shemirat Shabbat. 
but when it comes to Yaakov Avinu, we do have a place where it says that Yaakov Avinu kept Shabbat from the Torah. The fact that it says Yaakov Avinu, and because Yaakov Avinu has a pasuk that says he did keep Shabbat, hold those thoughts that, hold on, Torah wasn't given, I'll, we'll get to that also, right? Yirashet ha'olam, sorry, Yaakov does have a pasuk that talks about him keeping Shabbat. Why? Because it says, That's the pasuk that we just read. It says, Yaakov Avinu came to the city of Shechem. He came complete, whole. And it says, And he encamped before the limit of the city. Or before the city. What does that mean? Nichnas im dimdume chama. He came into the city right when the sun was about to set on Friday afternoon. Vekava techumin mi baod yom. And he made his techum Shabbat while it was still day. Okay, let me explain for those. Let me explain. So techum Shabbat is a halacha that. You, a person is not allowed to, on Shabbat, go outside of their city limits more than 2,000 amot. You don't have to worry about this unless, unless you live in a, in a place where right outside of 2,000 amot, you have a jungle. I, don't, I hope you don't live around places like this, because right now when we live in the city, everything is a city. Right? What? If you live in the valley, maybe coming out of your home might be a problem because there's... I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, someone else made the joke, I just followed. Is that what I'm saying? You know, people, maybe people living in Great Neck, because I love Great Neck so much. Maybe over there you got some fields, you got some... I don't know. I'm kidding. But it, but it used to be that you had a little tiny city, and then you had outskirts of the city for a long, long ways, and then you had another city. So when you would leave your city limits, you only had 2,000 amot. You cannot go out of your city more than 2,000 amot. Those are halakhot Shabbat. It's called techum Shabbat. The, encamp- like the borders of Shabbat. So now, ha- how was it done? If a person wanted to leave their techum Shabbat, what did you do? Let's say, let's say, let's say Aaron lives in a hut in the middle of a town in the valley. Right? And Rabbi Sakai <laughs> is coming somewhere in some place else off of the valley to give a lecture on Shabbat. Aharon wants to make it for the lecture, but he can't walk outside of his tchum because he lives in Valley Abad and he can't come out of his tchum more than 2,000 amot. For those who get the joke, he can't get out of the. I'm sorry, I'm just making jokes about Valley people. I think we just lost some listeners. They're like, ah, forget it, these 310ers, you know. <laughs> We're kidding. We love 818, 310, 516, 917, everybody, we love everybody. Uh, so he says he wants to go to the lecture on Shabbat, but he can't leave this to whom? More than 2,000 amot. So what does he do? He goes before Shabbat. He goes 2,000 amot to where the limit are, and he leaves himself food for Shabbat. And he says, I declare this tree... My magom Shabbat, I'm going to eat my cholent here. Right? Or ash, or hamin, or osh, polo, for Bukharians. Right? This is where I'm going to eat it. That becomes, now you have a limit of another 2,000 amot from that tree. Do you understand how it works? So you have 4,000 amot. Hopefully Rabbi Sakai will be within the 4,000 amot. If not, you're stuck. Live in LA. Okay. <laughs> so that's the khum. So Yaakov Avinu is saying here, that when it says, and he encamped by the city, it's saying that it actually came, Chachamim say he came, Erev Shabbat, Friday afternoon, and he set his Tchum Shabbat, so that he can walk further. Which means what? Yaakov Avinu was keeping Shabbat. He was keeping Halachot of Shabbat. Therefore, because we have a Pasuk that indicates Yaakov Avinu keeping Shabbat, it says, Yirashet ha'olam shelo bamida. Yaakov Avinu inherited the world, his children inherited the world without limits. What's the pasuk for that? Shene'emar, ve'hayazar acha ke'afar ha'aris. 
Hashem told Yaakov Avinu, your children are going to be like the sand of the earth. They'll be everywhere. They'll be spread out. Spread out. Abraham Avinu got it with limits. See this land you're in? Eretz Israel. Go to the width of it, the length of it. That's, those are your limits. Yaakov Avinu's children didn't get any limits. And it was what? Because Yaakov Avinu kept Shabbat. Okay? That's just not even an introduction so far. That's just the Midrash. Okay. Chaim. Oh, that is some good water. <laughs> uh, people are going to be wondering for years, was it really water or not? Right. So now, the commentators say, the Chachamim say, <coughs> ah, I found also that the Etz Yosef, the Sefer Etz Yosef elaborates on this Midrash and says also, by Avraham Avinu it says, Ha'aris Asher Atar Ro'eh. By Avraham Avinu it says, Hashem says to Avraham Avinu, the land that you see will be yours. Right? But when it comes to Ya'agov Avinu it says, Ufaratsta Yama Vakedma Safona Venegba. Your children can spread out south, east, west, north, all directions. So again, the Etz, the, the Etz Yosef says, those were the limitations. By Avraham Avinu says, the land that you see is yours. But, but by Yaakov Avinu says, your children will spread out, Yama Vagedma, right? So it means they were spread out all over. That was the inheritance. So it says, the Gemara in Yuma says, Avraham Avinu qiyemet kola Torah kula. That Avraham Avinu actually kept all of the Torah. The Gemara Yuma says that. Avraham Avinu, our forefather, kept all of the Torah. We have indications of such in our Bible. By Bible, I mean the Old Testament. What we call the Torah book. Right? The, why? Thank you for clarifying. You're, you're very welcome. I'm always all about clarifying things to people that listen. The Torah has that indication. What is the first indication you can think of that Avraham Avinu actually... Um, 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 kept the mitzvot. No, that was Yaakov Avinu. Dude, follow, bro. Avram Avinu. <laughs> Avram Avinu kept the mitzvot. The... Dairy and meat. Huh? Dairy and meat? Uh, in fact, that, we, we, there's a question because we're saying he didn't, technically, right? Because he gave butter and, but that's a, uh, that's a very confusing thing. So it's the same time though. Same time though. Same time. Same time. Same time, when the angels came, he says to Sarah Imenu to make what? To bake? Did it say bread? Does it say lehem? Uh, ugot. Ugot. Ugot is used in Tanakh for? Matzah. Yes. And it actually says the time. We have the da- timeline. The time that the angels visited Avraham Avinu was Pesach. And Sarai Menu was making matzah. And he wasn't going to give his guests bread, because you're not allowed to have hana'ah from chametz. Umatzah, chametz, umatzah, So, he gave them matzah. So we have indications in the Torah that Avraham Avinu kept the mitzvot. And all of them, Yitzchak Avinu. But even though we have that indication that he did keep all of the mitzvot, however, Avraham Avinu had a safek whether he is allowed to keep Shabbat or not. Why? Because he, okay, or he had a doubt. He wasn't Jewish, he was because we've done this in the Zerah Shimshon before. Okay? Before Matan Torah, before the giving of the Torah, the children of Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, were they considered already to be B'nai Yisrael or not? This is actually a very, very big question. We've done it in the Zerah Shemishon before. There's a lot of talk about it. This was actually the argument between Yosef at Sadiq and his brothers. Right? His brothers said, held, that they are B'nai Yisrael. Yosef at Sadiq's brother said, no, we are the children of Yaakov, technically speaking, Yisrael, 
we are already considered as Jews. Yosef Sadiq said, no, we're not. Until Matan Torah, we're not chosen yet. We keep the Torah because our forefathers have and because we have the Torah from Abraham Avinu. But we're not, we, we're not technically still considered Jews. When did this halakha come in? Let me just go back so that everybody knows what I'm talking about. So it's not gibberish for everybody. Yes, yes. Yes, we did this year last year. Exactly. Thank you for listening. I drink to you. And what does it say? The brothers had a problem. It says that, that Yosef HaTzadik went back to, uh, to Yaakov Avinu and brought negative report about his brothers. And so the Chachamim say, what was this negative report? One of them was that he was saying to his father that the brothers are eating what? What? Right. Ever minachai. Which was ripping, uh, the, you, you're not allowed to rip an animal part from the animal while the animal is still alive. That's not only a lav in the Torah, it's, it's, it's a general rule for all humankind. Right? You're not allowed to eat an animal while it's still alive. So now, what was the problem? Um, what was the problem? It was that... So this is according to one opinion that says when the brothers shechted an animal... Now, now, okay. According to Jewish law, where we have shechita laws, the way shechita works is that with one cut, the animal is considered dead. Because the way we shecht the animal, the sharpness of the knife and all the details that go within that of exactly where to cut, we know exactly what arteries need to be cut in one shot. Once those arteries are cut... The animal is considered halachically dead, even if it's moving. Because there's no more blood getting to the brain. And there's so many scientific things connected to it. Research it, you'll be amazed at how much halakha knows. But the animal is considered dead. So if you're shechting an animal, according to kashrut laws, once it's shechted, it's considered dead. Even if it's still moving, you could start eating. So now the brother is shechted an animal. And... They started ripping parts of the animal to cook it. Now the animal was still, let's say, moving a little bit. Yosef at Sadiq said, hold on, you can't, you can't take those parts off yet. You can't, you can't do that. You're not allowed to. They said, why? He said, because we are still known as B'nai Noach. B'nai Noach don't have shechita laws. So when you kill an animal, you actually have to wait for it to actually stop moving. They said, no, we're B'nai Israel, we're Jewish. We have shechita laws. We shecht it according to the Torah laws. Once we shecht, it's kasher. That was what was going on. So if Yosef at Sadiq who held according to his own halachic authority, we are not considered Jewish yet, went to his father and said, according to me, they're eating parts of an animal that's still alive. Do you understand how it makes sense now? It wasn't that he thought his brothers were rishaim, they're like ripping an animal apart. Well, so no, they had a discussion a halachic dispute. Right? So here too, we had the same question. <laughs> Avram Avinu, sorry to all the vegans. <laughs> you know, should be, should be put in one of the alhets. Alhets, shahatanu, lefanecha, shiachalnu. <laughs> no, I have to do a different one now because I give it all away. You guys make me work. Uh, so Abraham Avinu, when it came to Shabbat, he had a he had a safek. Is he considered truly Jewish because he keeps the Torah, or is he not considered Jewish? If he's considered Jewish, he has to keep the Shabbat. But if he's not considered to be Jewish, what does it say? It says Akum. It says, Akum shishavat chayav mita. The halakha is according to the Torah that a non Jew is not allowed to keep Shabbat. A non Jew is not allowed to keep Shabbat. They can keep all of the laws of Shabbat, but they gotta like flip a light once at least. You know what I mean? They cannot, a non Jew is not allowed to keep Shabbat. Why? Because the Torah says, Ot hi beni uben ben Israel. This is a sign, this is a covenant between me and Bnei Israel only. Nobody. What do you mean? 
You learn laws, you, you get the Lama Tet Melachot, and you learn all about it, and you look to everything you can keep. It's, it's all written down, really. Right? But an Andrew's not. So therefore, Avraham Avinu felt, he doesn't want to do an Avera. If he keeps Shabbat, he's doing a much, much bigger sin. Because look at it. You have a suffix. If he's really Jewish, he's not really Jewish because they don't have the Torah. He doesn't have the commandment. However, if he is not Jewish and he's keeping Shabbat, vice versa, he's doing something wrong. So Abraham Avinu in this situation was actually being machmir. He was being strict on himself and breaking Shabbat. He would break Shabbat out of doubt. He was being machmir, was being strict on himself not to put himself into the situation of was I allowed to, was I not allowed to. You understand? So that's what Abraham Avinu was doing. Therefore, Abraham Avinu had no choice. He had no choice in the matter whatsoever. Now, Now we have to understand, Yaakov Avinu, who did, according to the Pasuk that we just mentioned, Yaakov Avinu that did actually keep Shabbat, why was he not faced with the same safek? Why didn't Yaakov Avinu have the same safek of, hey, maybe, maybe I'm not fully Jewish, maybe, maybe I should be breaking Shabbat? Maybe I also have to be doing the same thing. Why is it that we see from the Pasuk that no, Yaakov Avinu kept Shabbat and because of that he was rewarded. Why didn't he have the same doubt as his grand- grandfather? As to maybe, oh no, you're mentioning that because of the Brit Milah, but Abraham Avinu had Brit, Yitzchak Avinu had the Brit. Actually the Brit started with Abraham Avinu, right? And more so, we don't find any reference of Yaakov Avinu actually keeping Shabbat until after his fight with the angel. We don't have any reference. It's only after he fought with the angel, that's why we brought the Pasuk. The Pasuk says, Yaakov Avinu fought with an angel, because he was left alone, and then right after that it says, Yaakov Avinu came whole to the city of Shechem, and when we say, he made Tchum Shabbat over there. So something happened after this war with the angel of Esav that made Yaakov Avinu start keeping Shabbat. Huh? Ah, oh, very nice, very nice, very good. It's actually, that's not mentioned here. You just both said a huge Hiddush. Hazaku Baruch, go have a Sauda tonight and drink on that. No, really. I didn't think of that. Very good, I didn't think of that. His name changed to Israel. Wow, that's, 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 that's brilliant. Very good. Very good. I don't, don't, don't be too like, eh. Okay? I'm just, just doing this on film. Oh, I didn't turn it off. Sorry. You guys are amazing. Hazaku Baruch. I drink water to that. Oh. <laughs> Everyone, I'm telling you, I'm driving people crazy. For years, people are going to be like, Rabbi Sakai drinks during his shearing. It's water. I'm telling you. I wish it was not. (laughs) So those are the two questions. We see from these Pesukim one one interesting fact. That it seems that if you look at the Pesukim where the angel is fighting with Yaakov Avinu, it seems that up until the morning, the angel couldn't beat Yaakov Avinu. It says... An angel fought with him until morning, and then when morning, came, morning time came, something changed. And the angel actually, in a sense, damaged Yaakov. Meaning, he had a sort of, he didn't have a victory, but he had a sort of a triumph when the morning came. What changed? Why was it that all night this angel could not defeat Yaakov? Morning time came, and it says that the angel hit Yaakov in a part of his thigh, and after that Yaakov Avinu was s- sort of limping. That's why we don't eat the Gid Hanasheh now from an animal, as a remembrance to that part, which is very Kabbalistic and so on and so forth. Right? But what changed? 
What was it that came out in the morning that changed that Yaakov Avinu sort of didn't have at night? So the Gemara says in Sanhedrin, it says, Gedulim saddirim yoter mi asharet. Listen carefully. It's important. Because we all want to reach this level in our lives. Men and women alike. Tzaddikim, the righteous, are greater than Malachi Hasharet, the heavenly angels. Righteous people are greater than the heavenly angels. That's a big deal for the Gemara to say it explicitly like that. Which means the Tzaddikim that you see in our generation, the people that we get brachot from, if you haven't already, do so. Like for instance, Harav Eliyahu Netaneli, you should be 120 years old. He is one of the tzaddikim of the generation. He is more powerful than Malachim, Malachi Hasharet, as the Gemara says. All of the tzaddikim of the past generation, our new generation, Hamovadia Zechet Tzaddik Vekadosh Livracha, or tzaddikim of uh, this generation, our Vitzchak Yosef, those people that are leaders in the generation, they are greater than Malachim. That is what we strive for. That is what life is about. To reach the point where there, not only we can't tell the difference between a human and an angel, but we are, a human being becomes more powerful than an angel. The reason of the fact that a tzaddik is more powerful than an angel is because we have something that angels do not have. See, we have the study of Torah, right? We learn Torah. Torah is great. It's everything. Like I, I gave a lecture last week just on the greatness in two different ways, on the greatness of Torah learning. There is nothing greater than Torah. However, there is one thing that you could say is greater than Torah learning. You know what that is? Bringing the learning into action. The mitzvot of the Torah. The Torah is given for us to learn it so that we can implement it into our lives. That is one power. It's a one-up. It's the 2.0 of Torah learning. You learn Torah, now put it into action. Like the Igerat Haramban says. You guys were learning the Igerat Haramban, right? What does the Ramban say to his, to his son? He says, anytime you learn, the moment you get up, think about what you just learned and how you can implement that into your life now. That is the purpose of learning Torah. The purpose of learning Torah is to do with your learning. What are you going to do with your learning now? So Bene Am Israel, a human being, has one thing greater than angels. Why? Because angels can learn Torah also. They do learn Torah. Angels do learn Torah. They're allowed to learn Torah. Because Torah is in the Shamaim too. We make the rules. We make the halachot. They have to follow our rules. But they can learn. They can learn. But they, they can't do the mitzvot. Angels don't have mitzvot. They have no commandments. So a tzaddik, a righteous person, is more powerful than an angel. Why? Because we do the mitzvot. Do you follow? So much? So far? Okay. And that's from Rashi in Baba Kama that says, Gadol limud ha-Torah, shahalomed Shahalimud mevi lidem aseh. Says, Limud Torah is very great. But why? Because the limud, the learning of Torah, brings a person to do the maaseh, to actually do the mitzvot. Rashi over there says, Alma maaseh adif. We see from here that the action is greater than the learning itself. Doing the mitzvot is greater than the, than the learning of the mitzvot itself. Because the learning of the mitzvot itself. What did you do? You just learned. Okay? You you Masa Avot Siman Abalim. You have to look in the look in the past to see how the greats used to do things. Right? Harav Ovad Yosef Zatzal was given a helicopter because he was he was like a government official. Right? So he had a helicopter. <laughs> what did he do? What did he use his helicopter for? He would go from city to city, give shiurim in his old age. He would travel by helicopter from one city so he's not stuck in traffic. And he would go give classes to the masses, then come back, then learn. <laughs> That's what do you learn for? To teach. 
What do you learn for? To do the mitzvot. It has to change you. <coughs> Therefore, throughout the entire night, the angel of Esav was not able to overpower Yaakov Avinu. Because Yaakov Avinu had the ma'aseh. He had the mitzvot. He had the Torah learning, and he had the mitzvot. So through all of that, the angel couldn't overpower Yaakov Avinu. Because the angel had the Torah. The Torah was always in Shamayim, before it was even given to, on earth. Right? So the angel had the Torah also, but didn't have the mitzvot. Yaakov Avinu did have the mitzvot. So what changed? Ah, oh, this is gorgeous. That's your question? That, that's, the, that's where we're going to go now. What changed? That's French. If you speak French, I'm sorry. <laughs> what changed? So it says, the Gemara in Sanhedrin, it says, that although angels sing HaKadosh Baruch Hu's praise, sing Shira for HaKadosh Baruch Hu every day, that's the job of the angels. Bnei Israel, the Gemara. This is what the Gemara says. Okay, Bnei Israel, so to speak, spiritually, can only sing it on Shabbat. I think spiritually, this means that Shabbat is the Shira that Bnei Israel sing to Hakadosh Baruch Hu, where angels sing Shira every day. We get an opportunity once a week, they get an opportunity every day. Right? So what happens? At that time, Yaakov Avinu was still not observing Shabbat. In the morning when the angel, it, when it came, Alot HaShachar, what did the angel say to Yaakov Avinu? Leave me because I need to go and sing Shira. I have a mitzvah now. Yaakov Avinu did not have the mitzvah yet. He wasn't even keeping Shabbat yet. But he realized something. After he got hurt by the angel, he said, hold on a second. He had something over me which I didn't have because I didn't have Shabbat. He had the mitzvah of Shira now. I don't have the mitzvah of Shira. Because the next day was Shabbat. It was coming to Shabbat. When Yaakov Avinu saw... When Yaakov Avinu saw that the entire night the angel was not able to beat him until the morning he realized that his superiority over the angel was his mitzvot. What changed when the angel all of a sudden took one mitzvah ahead which Yaakov Avinu didn't have? Right away Yaakov Avinu realized you know what then? Then I am supposed to be keeping Shabbat. That will be my superiority because the Shabbat is the Shira of Hashem. He sang Shira, I have to sing Shira. That's why the Pasuk right after, when it says Yaakov Avinu was left alone with an angel, the Pasuk right after it says Yaakov Avinu made a Tachum of Shabbat, that's why it was the first time for Yaakov Avinu keeping Shabbat. Because he only realized that he's able to keep Shabbat after his fight with the angel. Only after that. And it says, and this, this, <laughs> it's unbelievable. You know, we have all of the shatim and all of the mafarshim that we have on the Torah about did the forefathers keep Shabbat, did they keep the mitzvot? They all kept the mitzvot, you know? But there are questions though that come up. There are questions that come up as to how they kept the mitzvot. For instance, you know, Yaakov Avinu got married to two sisters. If, 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 if they kept all the mitzvot, how could he marry two sisters? Right? Because you're a, a, person, a Jew is not allowed to marry two sisters. Be married to two sisters. How did Yaakov Avinu marry two sisters? So there's a lot of Mepharshim that talk about it. The Ramban actually says, the Ramban says the only obligation of keeping the mitzvot before the Torah was only in Eretz Israel. Meaning before the Torah was given, the obligation on the avot and the imahot, the obligation on the forefathers, the patriarchs and the matriarchs, 
of keeping the mitzvot was only when they were in the land of Israel. Because the land of Israel was considered where the Kedusha is. When you're here, you need to be keeping all the mitzvot. The two wives of Israel? No. Married he married outside of Eretz Israel. the two wives. On his way back, who dies on the way? Rachel, Rachel Imenu. That's why the Ramban says, that's why Rachel Imenu needed to be buried and died outside of Eretz Israel. Outside, at, huh? At that time, so now, at that time, now, that part is Eretz Israel. The Ramban explains how at that time, that was not part of the known Eretz Israel of the Avot. That's why she died right before getting to his destination. Because it couldn't be that Yaakov Avinu would come back to the known Eretz Israel with two wives. They had to keep the mitzvot. He had that obligation. Right? And there are so many like that with the Avot. Like another one that was always very interesting to me, which was you mentioned, Yehuda. The, yeah, the milk and meat of the butter and the... When Abraham Avinu feeds butter and meat to the, to the angels. So it says, that's also brought down, and the Chachamim say that Abraham Avinu had the Sefer Yetzirah. The Sefer Yetzirah is a book that, believe it or not, we still have today. Right? The Sefer Yetzirah was a book that was written by Abraham Avinu, and it was passed down from generation. It's a part of very mystical sources, which to you and I would be gibberish, right? But it was Sefer Yetzirah, it was the book of creation. Through the Sefer Yetzirah, a person that knows how to learn the Sefer Yetzirah, you are able to create things. It's called the book of creation. It basically gives you the ingredients of how HaKadosh Baruch Hu created the world. And you're able to create things, to mimic, if you know how to. Avraham Avinu knew. So what did he do? He went and created the animals that he shechted. Technically speaking, according to some, he didn't even need to shecht. Understand? Because they weren't born animals. Therefore, because they were not born, they were created by him, they were not considered meat. That, in today's day and age, would make the vegan market go crazy. It's meat, but it's not meat. Right? And I always had this question. Uh, so therefore, because it's not meat, eating it with butter was not milk and meat mixed Wait, together. Huh? He created animals, but not created animals? Yeah, he did create animals. But well, then those that were created, because they were not born from a mother, they're not considered meat. So what are they considered? Yeah, wait. That's confusing. Uh, uh, it's considered better than meat. Whatever you can call it. I don't know. So Market know. it. <laughs> so where did it come from? Okay, so I'm saying, the Sefer Yetzirah gives you instructions on how to create even a human being from scratch. It's using dirt. and When God created the world, HaKadosh Baruch Hu also, within the world, He used the physicality of the world to create things. Like, why does, it, why does the Torah say, and God created man from the earth, dust of the earth? Right, why? Just say, he created man. Poof! And there's man. Right? In the physics of the world, it has within it all the particles of what man can be created from. Except the neshama. We can't give something in neshama. Neshama comes from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But that being can be created. So in halachic terms, today, you know, it could kind of be created to genetic meat, but it's not because genetic meat is, they take a gene of, of a living animal and from that they grow another animal. So it's not the same as what Avraham Avinu did. Avraham Avinu is from scratch, from dirt, making an animal, right? This is, right, no, it's not Abigail, it's bringing a, you know, other, um, other gedolim in the past generations have done this, right? Have made things, you know? That's why there's this, the, the, the mystery of the golem, you know, the golem, uh, whether it actually happened, some say it was, some say it didn't, but these things exist. And that's what Abraham Avinu did. The golem, search it. Um, so that was not considered meat. But today, with this, uh, what do they call it? There's this kind of beef they're making out of genetically made, huh? No, I think impossible is vegetables and stuff. This, this is actually, they made beef 
but it's but it's lab meat. It's made out of the so genetically like, mod, the like they genetically make meat by taking the genes of a cow and you know. So is that considered meat? I don't know. It's one of those things. I'm sure it's blood brought down in halacha. All of these things are brought down in halacha as to whether, but but uh, uh, as for something to be considered meat has to be born. That's why in the Torah there's a halacha of even if they shecht a a, a calf, right? And they once they shecht it, they open the stomach, they find a baby in there. That baby is parv because it's not born, right? Whatever's Whatever is inside is parv. I thought it was just right. shechted. It, the, what is it called? It doesn't have to be shechted. It's not considered a living. It's it's not. You can make a burger out of that and make a cheeseburger. I think so. I think so. I have to look it up again. Don't quote me on this. No, you guys are making me all confused with all sorts of different things. Scratch that. Uh, I'm not a hundred percent. I'm not a hundred percent sure. I know that doesn't need to be shechted. Not 100% sure. I would have to look it up again. But that is, um, that is a lot of stuff that we learned tonight <laughs> over one parasha. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen. Thank you for listening. Amen.